all very much for coming along this morning after quite a lively night last night. And it's really a huge pleasure for me to, to be here and um, to be talking um, on this day, which is all about um, outreach. And I was to told to talk about alien species and citizen science, and um, that is indeed what I will do. But I want to begin um, by thanking many, many people. And, if I was to mention all the people I've collaborated with, it would take a very, very long time. So I hope that they all know who they are and um, know that the appreciation I have for them. I also want to thank Simon and his team for all of their organization and um, to ENTO16 for inviting me here. It, it really is um, a delight and I thoroughly enjoyed um, yesterday and all the various things we were doing. So over to Alien Species and Citizen Science. And there is going to be a fair amount on ladybirds as well. So um, hopefully it's going to be a relaxing start to the day for you. It's going to be quite a lot of sort of sound bites and lack of depth probably. But I hope you'll excuse that. And I hope that you'll grab me if you want to have any details about any of the particular things that I talk about as I go through. So invasive non-native species, I think that many people are now familiar with the concept of invasive non-native species, but just to be sure, when I'm talking about non-native species, I mean a species that's been introduced into a new region of the world from somewhere else by humans. And that human involvement is extremely important in the definition of non-native species, and that is a conventional biological diversity definition. When we're talking about invasive non-native species, this is the small subset of those species that cause some kind of problem, maybe a threat to biodiversity, to the economy, or to society. And it's estimated that for Europe, and it's thought this is an underestimate, that it's about costing about 12 billion euros a year to manage or control or um, for surveillance of that invasive non-native species subset. And the other staggering kind of figure, really, is this graph here, showing this escalation in the numbers of new arrivals. I can well, it doesn't matter. You can see that maybe it is. Is it working? Well, you can see that there's this um, strong increase in the mean number of species arriving over time. And I've recently been involved um, in a paper which we're hoping will be in Nature Communications uh, fairly soon, which is showing that there isn't a leveling off of this. There doesn't seem to be a saturation in the accumulation of um, non-native species um, globally. So just to try and sort of put some um, pictures to it and to think about these species in more detail, well, hot and top fig, for instance, is um, a good example, perhaps, of an invasive non-native species. And it's really interesting that when you see some of these species back in their native range, for instance, so this is um, hot and top fig on a dune system in South Africa, which I was lucky enough to visit as um, part of an insect invasion workshop um, last year. And you can see that it's quite a small and scraggy little clump of hot and top fig. And actually, it was surrounded by penguins. That's why I'd gone there to see the penguins, not the hot and top fig. But it was great to see it anyway. And then this is in um, Newquay on the dune systems. And you just see this swathe of hot and top fig. And I think what's um, fascinating is that when you look at just the footprint, for example, of something like hot and top fig above the ground, you can see the area of extent that it's covering. And it's quite vast on the dune systems um, of Newquay, for instance. But there have been some studies um, with some plant systems going below the ground and beginning to look at what is the footprint below the ground. And it's much, much bigger. And I think that that um, kind of, for me, highlights how many knowledge gaps we have and how much understanding we need to develop to really get a good um, idea of quantifying these impacts of these invasive non-native species. We still have a huge amount um, of work that we need to do. Forward. I'll go forward here. I just thought it would be nice to look at a few of the different species and think about what roles they might be playing within um, their new region. And undoubtedly, the vast majority of non-native species arriving in a new region don't present any problems at all. 
And I love the example of the briony ladybird, of course, because it's a ladybird, so unbiasedly I, I really enjoy this as an example. But it's a big and slightly hairy ladybird. I mean, what could be more beautiful? And it has probably one of my favorite ladybird larvae. Um, it's a very exquisite looking larva. And it was first found in Surrey, in the back garden, in the mid 1990s. And then if we look at the distribution map, see if I can get this pointer working. I can't, so I will point. If you look on the distribution map over time, you can see that the spread of that species has been really very, very slow. It's a species that feeds specifically on white bryony. It's, it's not a concern, it's in fact an absolute delight. But then in contrast, if we take a look at the harlequin ladybird, also an absolutely exquisite and beautiful ladybird, but we look at its pattern of spread, for instance, and the first record the first record was 2004, but then in 2003, there was one sample was found in um, looking at the historic aphid um, suction trap samples from Rothamsted. So 2003 seems to be about when it arrived in the UK. And it's gone through this very, very rapid um, spread, uh, over 100 kilometers per year. But then we can see that something's happening in Scotland. It doesn't seem to be spreading um, very much at all in Scotland. And actually, the spread in the Republic of Ireland and um, Northern Ireland is also has been quite slow. But nevertheless, we can perhaps think of it as a, as a high, potentially high-impact species. It um, is an integral predator. It lots eats other predators of aphids, for instance. But it will also eat a whole variety um, of other insects, too. So perhaps we could quite rightly consider this one as, as a less than ideal species to, to, to have arrived. Then there are some species such as um, the ink pen crocuses, which are found in, um, in Berkshire, that um, indeed their presence now has given status to certain sites as being um, triple SI. So they're actually celebrated and enjoyed hugely um, by people. Then there are some species for which we really can't make our minds up. Some of them, you know, we think maybe they're good, maybe they're bad. Buddleia, fantastic as a nectar source for, um, for insects, but not great in the railway systems in terms of causing problems to um, the general infrastructure. So we could go through many, many different species in this way and think about the various merits and dismerits um, of their presence in, in new systems. And I think we would come up with a lot of differing um, perspectives. And this is why I think, and a theme perhaps of running through what I'm going to say, is how we really need to get better at quantifying impacts and understanding impacts at various scales um, to really get a better idea. And there's no doubt that there are differing perspectives. And, and this is a book that was written by Fred Pierce called The New Wild. It came out, I think it was last year. And he celebrates invasive species as being nature's salvation. So quite a different perspective, perhaps, um, to, to some others. And on, on, on reading his book, and I was asked to um, comment um, on his book by going kind of head to head with him on a radio interview for Inside Science, which was really fascinating and forced me to do an awful lot of preparation in advance, really to kind of get the arguments in my mind clear from my perspective. And I think that communication is really important to counter some of this controversy. And often we find that actually there's not such a massive divide. It's just perhaps a different weighing up of the evidence or perhaps a lack of the evidence in the first place that is not allowing us to come to some kind of consensus. So it was a fascinating experience both to read his book and also um, to discuss with him. One of the reasons why I think as well there can be this um, controversy, particularly within invasion biology, is that there is a tendency to ignore the complexity. Um, I think we see this quite often in science communication that we're often looking for quite a simple message or we might be wanting to downplay things because we feel that that's what people can take on board. But I think it's really important actually that we embrace the complexity. These systems are beautiful because they are complex. And if we can engage people with understanding the nuances and, and accepting that you know we don't understand all the different strands and complexities of the systems that we work on, that's what makes it exciting. There are gaps for us to fill in. We don't need to expect that everyone else is going to also understand the complexity, but we can kind of embrace that complexity. And I think we ignore it at our peril because that's where I think we get these misunderstandings of quite a profound um, nature 
within science, not just invasion biology. And I think this article, for instance, is, is, is a good example. And often the Times is really excellent at their reporting, and there's some fantastic stuff in this. Um, but the headlines spot the difference. One ladybird is at risk, the other is a cannibal. Well, actually, they're both cannibals. Ladybirds are highly cannibalistic, not just the harlequin ladybird. And um, also, actually, from the studies that we've done on the long-term data, the seven-spot ladybird down in this corner is um, not particularly at risk. The, the distribution trends are quite stable for that species. So we just need to get better at ensuring that the communication that we do is effective and embraces those levels of complexity where they're needed. I think the other big aspect that causes controversy and contention within communication is that um, we all struggle with uncertainty. And I, I sometimes get the feeling when I'm talking to a journalist or talking to someone else and, and I'm kind of waving my hands a bit and edging, um, hedging my bets a little bit around something because I'm not entirely convinced, you know, we need to do more studies and we need to get the um, confidence um, limits down a bit, etc. And I sometimes think that they must be thinking, you know, what kind of scientist is this that she can't just tell us what is the answer to this quite simple question in their minds? And I think we need to get better at communicating about uncertainty and the way in which we address that within the studies that we do and how we accept it as part of what we do through the um, experimental work that we're doing, um, for example. And the bottom line is we need to have robust evidence for many, many different purposes. But in particular, perhaps, we need it for decision-making. And we know that within um, conservation biology, there are many, many important decisions that could be made. And, and often, there's not a right or a wrong decision. Um, we need to weigh up the evidence. And we need to have good evidence in order to be able to do that. And we're seeing that, um, for example, the indicators that are produced on, on an annual basis are a really fantastic way of communicating trends in a whole variety of different um, biodiversity um, scenarios. So with all this in mind and the challenges that we have in terms of communicating our ideas and making decisions going forward, I would argue that there is a place for citizen science and that citizen science can really bring together excellent engagement and communication alongside real science. And for me, that's what citizen science is. It is about having that science at the core. It's about perhaps having a hypothesis that, being, that is being addressed or some data that's being gathered to address a hypothesis um, in the future. And it does combine engagement um, as part of that. And actually, for me, my involvement within citizen science kind of came about before there was the term citizen science. And I think it was about the fact that I love science communication, and I'm really task-driven. And I thought, well, we don't just need to talk. We, we can do more than just talk about the science. We can actually do science together and, and get some more data. And, and I find it works extremely well. It's not necessarily straightforward. It's certainly not free using volunteers um, to gather data, but it is extremely effective. So I would argue that I could create a slide with many, many different words that tell you why I think citizen science has huge value. I think it's enormously creative. I think it's fun. I think it's a fantastic way of informing people about the work that we're doing and getting them involved. I think it is inspiring for some people, and it does captivate some people, and it does um, help us to gather data. And actually, the, the bottom two pictures are my two daughters. Um, so I guess it's a little bit biased to say that maybe they're inspired and captivated, and you perhaps you'd ask them whether or not that is indeed the case, um, but I would like to think maybe sometimes. So getting to the subject of citizen science and alien species, I think that there is a huge role that citizen science can play in gathering the huge data sets that we need in order to be able to address the big issues around um, alien species. And um, I was recently involved in a workshop um, run by an initiative called um, Geobon, and it was about trying to think of ways in which we could really ambitiously engage the whole world in monitoring biological invasions and how we could begin to gather data so that we can produce indicators, not just at a, a UK level or European level, but indeed at a global um, level. And um, it was a really fascinating workshop, and um, it highlighted how countries can capitalize on citizen science and using particularly the new and emerging technologies um, 
both online and remote, for capturing data and improving um, records of, in this case, invasions, but you could translate that to other systems as well. And this um, project, or this um, particular workshop, through the Geobomb project, produced um, a, a sort of booklet about things called essential biodiversity variables. And I don't know if people have come across them. I find them quite hard to grapple with in my own mind, but essentially they're kind of um, compounds of variables that give us some kind of story to tell that should be good for communicating an issue. So for example, um, in the case of invasive species, it might be something very simple, like the number of non-native species on a country-by-country -country basis, for instance. But within this, um, this booklet, we included a short section on um, how system science can be used um, to support invasion um, monitoring. And indeed, um, at the beginning of um, this summer, I had the fortunate opportunity to, to go to Africa um, to help with a workshop there on citizen science very broadly and looking at um, the opportunities and barriers for citizen science as an approach within East Africa and also to look at prioritizing the kind of issues that could be addressed um, using citizen science as an approach. And this work um, was funded by the British Ecological Society and my um, institute, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and working in partnership with the Tropical Biological Association. And it was a fantastic few days of just hearing ideas and, and seeing the huge similarities in approaches in East Africa in comparison to, for example, um, the UK, but also notably the differences too. So even very profoundly, the whole concept of a volunteer in East Africa is very, very different to how we might conceptualize a volunteer um, within um, the UK. But one of the striking things that came out was when we asked the delegates to think about um, ranking a list of themes that could be um, addressed with citizen science, invasive alien species were seen as a top priority um, for citizen science um, during this workshop. So we're certainly looking forward um, to building on this. So just to interject some kind of structure um, to this plenary lecture, I'm going to kind of give a bit of a ramble through invasions. I'm going to talk about how citizen science can be used for documenting new arrivals, how it can be used for horizon scanning, for exploring pathways of arrival, and for unraveling impacts. And, and as I've mentioned, it, it wouldn't be the same for me if I didn't indulge in a short section on ladybirds. So first of all, thinking about documenting um, the new arrivals. I lead a project um, that's funded by DEFRA to um, essentially just produce a database of all of the non-native species in Britain, and within that database, a whole set of attributes about those non-native species, such as their date of first arrival, where they first arrived, um, their kind of um, ecological function, etc. And Within this database, we have the sort of central register with the sort of basic information, but we also have lots of fact sheets and more detail for particular species that DEFRA might be very interested in having more information on. And then we link to the National Biodiversity Network Gateway for the data um, on occurrence of these species and to provide maps alongside them. And the volunteers have just been absolutely instrumental in this project because, as I'm sure you're aware, just within entomology, much of the expertise in terms of on-the-ground understanding of the taxonomic diversity of species in the UK is held by volunteer experts through the recording schemes and societies, for instance. And so we've been able to involve the recording schemes and societies from a very early stage in this project um, to be able to provide information to keep this database up to date. And um, they have just really been fantastic in being extremely reactive and sending information in very rapidly so that we do have a current um, database. It's also been a partnership with the British Trust for Ornithology, the Marine Biological Association, and the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. Um, and it has been a fantastic project to work on. We've had five years of funding from DEFRA, which has just been great. Um, we'll be hoping that they continue to fund it um, after next year. So when we have a look in this database, there's about 2,000 established non-native species in Britain. So by established, I mean that we have evidence that they are reproducing um, within Great Britain, that they have sustained populations. So there are probably about another 1,000 that have maybe just touched their tarsi down, um, but haven't got any evidence of establishment or 
if they're not an insect, they touch whatever else they, they might wish to touch down. So about 2,000 established non-native species in Britain. And then if we break that down, and we do this every year, we produce a scorecard, essentially, for um, describing the current status of non-native species in Great Britain. So remember that these are all non-native species, not just the invasive component. And the plants are numerically dominant, so about 1,500 species of plant, and then we look at the animals, about 458 established non-native animals. And the mathematical people in the audience will realize that's not adding up um, to 2,000, but of course there's a scattering of other groups as well um, within that. Then when we look at the impact of those species, and um, both from an ecological and human impact perspective, we can see that about 270 of those species are documented as having some kind of impact, so we might term them as being the invasive non-native species. And then it's really interesting that with the plants, it's only about 6.6% of the plants have any kind of impact, despite their huge numerical dominance. But when we look at the animals, it's much, much higher. So to me, well, that's quite interesting in the first place. Maybe it tells us we need to be more concerned about the animals and the plants, perhaps. But also, maybe it tells us that we need to look on a case-by-case -case, um, example. And we could do a lot of different analyses within this, using this database, and all kinds of spatial things um, that we've looked at as well. Um, but I would uh, just refer you to this paper on biological invasions if you want um, some more detail in that regard. So another way in which we've involved volunteers, and particularly the sort of expert amateurs, is through horizon scanning in Britain. So one of the pieces of work that we were asked to do for DEFRA was to, to think ahead. It's all very well us documenting these species as, as they arrive, thinking, well, we have this wonderfully diverse and fantastically up-to-date database of these things as they arrive. But actually, it makes an awful lot of sense to try and make some predictions about what it might be that's going to arrive um, next, so that um, DEFRA or whoever can begin to think about ways in which they might um, prevent the arrival. And that's really the best way to deal with the invasive non-native species is to prevent their arrival in the first place. So we came up with a method for horizon scanning um, species in Britain and we used methods that have been um, taken from um, Bill Sutherland's group, and maybe you've read some of his papers around um, sort of consensus building and prioritization, for example, of the next 100 big ecological issues. So we kind of use a very similar workshop approach. We're gathering together a group of experts and doing quite a lot of preliminary work, um, first of all, around risk assessments and gathering of information and within subgroups, um, for example, plants, um, freshwater species, marine species, um, etc., gathered all of this information and then brought all these experts together um, to share that information and kind of to talk through the different species and come up with a consensus around which are the next species that are posing a threat to biodiversity um, within Britain, within um, the next um, 10 years. And we've used the same method um, for Europe now as well. And it does work really effectively. And there are papers out there that you can read about the sort of pitfalls of a method such as this. Of course, it's dependent on the experts that you gather in the first place. And there can be all kinds of things that go on in the room in terms of dynamics through the process. But you can work very hard to kind of offset those and um, come up with quite um, a robust um, outcome. And we had quite a number of amateur experts gathered through this workshop to provide us with information on the species across these diverse taxonomic groups and, of course, across the environments of freshwater, marine, and terrestrials. It's a huge undertaking. And actually, when we got commissioned to, to do the same thing in Europe, I did kind of take a deep breath and think, this could be utterly chaos. Um, but thankfully, we had a fantastic... Um, experience of, of running the same project in Europe. And the other thing that we do within these consensus workshops is we invite stakeholders along. So, for example, DEFRA were there in the audience as observers so they can see the process and it, it's real to them as to how we've come up with the list that we do come up with. And 
just to, to give a few insect highlights from the horizon scanning list, within our top 10, we were able to rank species within the top 10, top 20, top 30, and then we just had this general broad list of other species that we, our brains, we couldn't do any more ranking after 30. It just became too difficult. Um, but Asian hornet is one of the species that's in our top 10, and it's been reported a lot in the media. There's lots of attention about um, people thinking it's arrived. Well, it hasn't yet. We don't have any confirmed sightings um, within um, mainland Britain. There have now been some records from the Channel Islands, um, but, but um, not not on mainland Britain. And it's a species that would have been hard to predict had it not arrived at some random event in France in 2004, just within a pottery confinement, consignment. But it's spread quite rapidly um, in France, and, and that's why it's a concern. And it has a particular liking for um, honeybees, and um, so it would be a concern, particularly for beekeepers, but it will feed on other um, insects as well. Another species that we put further down the list that fascinates me is the um, Argentine ant. And um, the reason we put it further down the list is because um, there needs to be a bit of a warmer climate in the next 10 years if we're going to see establishment of this species, for instance. So there have been odd records um, in London, for instance, um, but nothing, nothing more than that. And it really was a consensus that we don't quite have a warm enough climate at the moment for it. But if we did, then it is an ecosystem engineer. It can have quite profound cascading effects within the system it arrives within. Um, and so we would consider it um, quite a threat. So that's just to give a couple of the species, but then we published um, the, the, the results and um, I don't know whether it's kind of something to celebrate or something to commiserate over, but some of the species started to arrive. So in some sense we could think, well, it proved the success of the activity that we did, but also in a sense it kind of undermines what we did in terms of it won't, we weren't able then to prevent their arrival. So, for example, this Asian shore crab um, was one of the first species from our list um, to be reported in Wales in 2014. Our number one species, we all agreed to put the quagga mussel at um, number one on our list, and this is because of the profound effects it can have within water bodies um, that it arrives, and it really um, can change them both the water chemistry, for instance, the um, algal community changes. This has a cascade of um, trophic interactions throughout the water body. And then things such as the fact that it um, produces toxic feces is um, not great um, for the system either. So everyone unanimously agreed that that was the number one concern. And it um, was found quite soon um, near Heathrow in a reservoir. And of course, um, absolutely captured the attention um, of the media. Now, one of the species that was on our list, quite highly ranked, not an insect, but uh, not a mollusk um, or a crustacea, but the mammal, a raccoon. And um, I think some people thought that maybe we'd lost leaves of our senses to have a raccoon on our horizon scanning list. But raccoons are quite problematic in Austria and Germany, so that was part of the evidence that we used um, for considering them. And um, they, they are kept in captivity throughout the UK, and they are fantastic escape artists. So there are many ways in which we felt that they, they should be on the list. And, um, but they were further down the list than some of these other species. But then on Twitter, somebody sent um, this photo saying this is a raccoon, isn't it? And um, sitting beautifully in someone's fuchsia bush in their back garden. And um, then a flurry of records came through um, Twitter and through Springwatch, for instance. And um, they always look so cute, though, these raccoons. Um, but there it is. Um, so there, have been, um, there has been some evidence of various small raccoon populations, but they have been reunited with their, their owners. Then our most recent species was one of the um, aquatic um, plants, this, this water weed that was reported just this year. And actually, this highlights some of the problems that we have in terms of, for example, the taxonomy around these species can be really complex. And there are other species that can look like this. So it took a little while, indeed, for this species to be confirmed um, as 
petrify them. Um, but it was, and that was another of the ones upon our list. So this work's published in Global Change Biology, and um, particularly the method which we have used, as I said, um, for an exercise in Europe, and it has been very effective. And it was great to be able to include um, some of the volunteers, well, all of the volunteers who were involved um, within the authorship of the paper. This horizon scanning work links straight into an alert system that we run and we use a system called iRecord, which is a general software recording system for any kind of wildlife. So if you're not all registered on iRecord, I strongly encourage you to do so and record all the things you see when you're, you're out and about. And we use iRecord for the alien species, and we have some very specific forms. Um, for example, for um, Asian hornets, the so people can report sightings of concern. And we don't mind how many reports we get of photographs of European hornets, for instance, within iRecord record. It gives us a good picture of, um, in terms of surveillance for um, Asian hornet. And again, the system relies on um, the volunteer experts, particularly for the verification of the records um, within that system, and particularly for providing additional um, information. But it then links to the relevant stakeholders, for example, through the Non-Native Species Secretariat, which we're really lucky to have such a fantastic coordinating body um, within um, Great Britain to be able to um, coordinate some of this work and they then inform the other stakeholders who need to be informed and then action is taken and, and that action isn't necessarily about um, eradication, it can be about biosecurity of course and then the importance about communicating messages around biosecurity, so for example with the quagga mussel having really good biosecurity around the places where it's found to try and prevent its spread um, to other water bodies so asking anglers to check and clean and dry their equipment, for instance. So some of the other work that we have been um, doing, and um, less with a citizen science approach, but links into the citizen science in terms of surveillance subsequently, is prioritizing pathways. And this is all about sort of preventing the arrival of these species in the first place. If we can know which are the major pathways which are carrying these invasive non-native species in, in the first place, then maybe strategies can be put into place um, that can minimize um, their impact. And I had the, the pleasure of working with the Convention on Biological Diversity to come up with some terminology um, around pathways of introduction. And it sounds like it's a really dry project, thinking about terminology and harmonizing information in databases. Um, but actually, it was really very exciting and, and great to have the discussions um, that led to this particular um, document. And then it's been quite exciting for me anyway, hopefully for some other people as well, to bring together some big databases like the Global Invasive Species Database and the European Database DAISY on alien species, align them with these path, this pathway information and um, begin to look at patterns and trends in pathways of high impact species um, and other alien species across different taxonomic groups and across um, different environments. And although this doesn't have a huge citizen science um, component to it, of course much of the information that we have in the first place is provided by by um, the citizen scientists on the ground in, in their various guises. And this work has been able to feed in to inform the new European regulation, which was um, came into force in January 2015. And um, again, it's been a great privilege to be involved in the consultation of providing scientific information um, to feed into that regulation and the horizon scanning work that we've done. And also we've been doing some work around um, impacts um, has been um, great to work alongside the European Commission um, on that. And with huge teams of people um, across Europe, it's been a very exciting few years. So one of the other aspects that I have become um, interested in, so back in my PhD days I was looking at um, a fungal pathogen and my community ecologist and was fascinated by um, the um, interactions between insects and this particular fungal pathogen. So I constantly have disease and parasites and in the back of my mind, perhaps not literally, hopefully, um, but they're, they're there nonetheless, and, and I have quite a passion for their, their life histories. So there's been some fantastic work, for instance, by um, Alison Dunn at Leeds University on invasions and um, pathogens and disease driving invasive processes. But we realize that in all these databases that we have, we have very little information on um, the disease side of things. And um, so again, we did another of these sort of consensus workshops to look at barriers um, 
to our understanding of um, the, the role of disease and also the whole concept of alien pathogens um, across different environments and different taxonomic groups. And this is just coming out now in conservation letters, our, our um, results from that work. So one of the projects that um, I lead that kind of brings a lot of this information together is a cost action called Alien Challenge. And um, we've got our last year now. I've got some postcards at the front here. Um, for us by the Field Study Council, so thank you very much, um, Rebecca, and your team for those. And if you'd like one, do come and um, take one. It tells you a little bit more about that project. But it's been a fantastic opportunity um, to network with other people through a whole variety of different activities and bring some of this work across Europe um, together. So, ladybirds, perhaps the part that, well, I've certainly been waiting for, um, the opportunity to talk to you a little bit more about um, the work we've been doing on ladybirds in particular. And, you know, if it wasn't for the harlequin ladybird, I don't think I would be necessarily working within the sort of invasion biology um, theme, but I kind of got carried along with the harlequin ladybird and perhaps um, have it to thank for the fantastic interactions I've had as a consequence. And I'm going to, lots of the photos that I'll be showing you come from the volunteers who are sending in records, and they really are quite amazing and quite inspiring. And I often find that every photo they send in has some kind of story to tell, and, and often they will tell the story of their photo, um, and it just makes absolutely fascinating um, reading. So I don't think necessarily Harmonia axiridis needs very much of an introduction. As I already mentioned, the first record was in 2004, and I was working at Cambridge University on sabbatical leave at the time with Mike Majurus, and um, he put out a press release, the ladybird has landed, and this is Harmonia axiridis, the most invasive ladybird on earth, and not surprisingly, the media went wild with that story. And um, he also made a, a very grand prediction that there would be one winner, 1,000 losers. And he based this around the fact that Harmonia, Harmonia axiridis is a top predator. It interacts with a whole variety of other species, often in quite a negative, um, competitive, um, or predatory way. So that was the basis um, for that argument. So the ladybird, or the Cox Melody recording scheme, had been going since the early 1970s. And there's no doubt that I certainly stand on the shoulders of giants who went before me in terms of leading the um, Cox Melody recording scheme. And Mike Majurus had taken it over between mid-1980s and mid-1990s and started to engage the public through schemes such as Watch in getting involved um, in broadening the involvement of people within ladybird recording. But he then published a book in the 1990s and um, the survey went a little bit quiet. But it was seen, and we saw the opportunity by the Harlequin ladybird arriving as an opportunity to reinvigorate um, the ladybird survey and call it the UK Ladybird Survey. And so we launched a website with online recording, very different to iRecord now. And it's not so long ago, I mean, it's 2005 that we launched this survey online. And just in that kind of 11 years, technology and things has changed beyond, um, beyond how we would have imagined at that time. Um, uh, we launched this online survey. We think it's probably one of the first online recording wildlife sites um, that there was within the UK. And um, it's just been amazing to be involved. So from that very first record in 2004, with the spread at 100 kilometers per year, we have this amazing database of occurrence of Harmonia axiridis um, over time. And as I said as well, the people have been so important um, within this as well. And you know, many of these people I don't meet. We have about 17,000 recorders now to the Ladybird Survey, or at least names within the database. And some of them are recording very, very frequently. And um, some of them, so for example, the letter in the middle there, um, this lady, Judy Smith, writes to me once or twice a year and tells me about the ladybirds that <clears throat> go behind her um, thermostat in the hallway of her flat. And she tells me how the two spots move in first, but then the harlequins come along and oust them, uh, oust the two spots. And every year she writes to me and tells me the numbers. And it's really lovely to hear from her. There's another um, wonderful, inspiring lady on the Isle of Man who gets people involved across the Isle of Man in ladybird recording. And she's really become the node for ladybird recording. And I know she does a lot more than that as well um, within the Isle of Man. So these incredible people, Bill Phillips in Loughborough, who records natural enemies as well as the ladybirds. I could go on and on. On, talking about these volunteers um, and their, their various um, stories. It's, it's just fantastic. 
But we have worked really hard at getting people involved within Ladybird Recording. And we were, people did say to us, and particularly from the biological control community, were we not afraid that we were going to be giving biocontrol a bad name because of harmonia, axillaries, and all the publicity that was arising from it? But I think it goes back to my thoughts in terms of conveying the complexity and talking to people about, um, about ladybirds more generally. And, and I don't think that has been the case. Still, that love of ladybirds um, is really apparent when you go out and meet people. And people can recognize that Harmonia axoridis is, is a different kind of species. And, and you can have really in-depth discussions about that. And um, we've been really lucky to have so many opportunities. So for example, the BBC Breeding Places chose us as their survey um, in 2009. And it was just great working with them and working with many, many school children um, to get involved in recording. And one of the things they asked us to do um, is to produce um, one Friday actually they called me and said we've had a brilliant idea how about ladybird top trumps and I said you know I've dreamt about writing ladybird top trumps and I, I generally had I had already thought out all the categories and begun getting the scores in my head and um, even started an Excel spreadsheet ready for this moment um, and um, so I couldn't be more delighted and then they said but we'll need it by Monday and I thought well that's no problem because I've already been thinking about it and very kindly as well a colleague John Sloggett who is in the Netherlands at the time, I was a bit concerned about the chemical defense side of things and how I was categorizing that. So I asked him to peer review them over the weekend as I was producing the scores and told him what my evidence base was. And um, for example, the um, epilachnids, which are these plant feeding hairy ladybirds, I, I had downrated their chemical defense. And he said, oh, no, no, I think you need to, to give them a higher score. So it was all peer reviewed and I took on board the comments and um, they were really seemed to be enjoyed by um, by whoever used them. Um, so that was really fantastic. And then more recently, Julia Donaldson, who's probably more famous for um, the Gruffalo than perhaps what the Ladybird Heard. But when the Ladybird Heard was published, um, the publishers asked me to produce a fact file um, for younger children to go with it. And um, then the sequel came out, What the Ladybird Heard Next, and um, they invited me along to the, the book launch to give a talk about ladybirds and to take some ladybirds along. And, uh, you know, I don't know, how, we, I'm not so good at evaluating the outcomes of this engagement. I just find the engagement hugely fun, but I should do more on the evaluation. I don't know how many people that then does encourage, um, but it certainly is a lot of fun. And then um, this is uh, David Urey, and he was at the Society of Biology. And I heard him singing at um, the British Science Festival. And he was singing about pygmy shoes and monogamy. And it was a really great song. And I said to him afterwards, oh, it would be fantastic. We don't have a ladybird song. It would be really wonderful to have a ladybird song. I just it's sort of throw away comments. And then he phoned me up a few weeks later and said, you know, this ladybird song you talked about, if you give me a story, I'll turn it into a song. And what genre would you like? So I thought, well, I think ladybirds would like it to be indie. And um, I think that it would be great to um, have um, parasoid, the parasitoid story, because I feel like the parasitoid gets a bad deal down in Campus Coxinelli, which is this little bacronid parasitoid of ladybirds. So I thought this is a moment where we can inspire people with quite how beautiful this parasitoid is. So he, he gave this beautiful song where he halfway through turns into a parasitoid. And and um, we played Latitude, the, the pop festival um, over in Suffolk. And um, actually, Victoria Burton, I think, is in the room. She was there too, which was fantastic. We had a really amazing three days, didn't we, of public engagement. I'd highly recommend pop festivals. And um, we did feel that some of the children that were getting dropped off in the morning were of those very hungover parents, who then they stayed with us for much of the day. But that was fine. But anyway, on a daily basis, this song was performed. I would give a short talk about the kind of ecology behind the song lyrics and there was a dance um, which I stood aside for and um, the children seemed to really enjoy it. The only problem was that of course when the ladybird succumbed to the parasite the children were sort of pleading with me to tell us that the, the ladybird lives. And I thought, actually that's a really difficult question for me to, uh, to discuss but um, the parasite is going to go on and have a great life for lay 200 eggs and another 200 ladybirds and how exciting that is for that parasite. Um, but I'm not entirely sure that we did manage to get our message convincingly across that the parasite was also a fascinating part of this system. A few years ago, I put the ladybirds onto Twitter, and I was a real Twitter skeptic. And, um, 
but I love it. I absolutely love it. I think it's fantastic, and it's fantastic for natural history. And for ladybirds, it has brought in some additional people into the recording side, because a lot of people post photographs um, within Twitter. And somebody called Chris Doward, who I'd recommend you take a look at his photos within Twitter, absolutely beautiful. And he sends an awful lot of records in um, as a consequence. And um, I have found it to be a really great source of providing feedback, but also putting out a call for action at certain times um, of the year. And the Ladybirds now have about 4,500 followers, and um, it is the Ladybirds who are the charismatic ones. That's pretty much all I um, tweet about. You can see me saying both Harlequin Ladybirds, all Harlequin Ladybirds. There's not, there's not a lot more that goes on than Ladybirds within my um, Twitter account, um, but it. it it's a great way to communicate. And actually, last night, I saw um, on Twitter that the first day cover is going to be out next week, 14th of September. You can pre-order now um, for the set of stamps. And I was working with um, the Royal Mail over the last couple of years um, on this project to produce these stamps. So it's really exciting um, to, see them, to see them out and um, ready for distribution. I, I can't wait to actually see them physically. A couple of years ago, we launched a smartphone app, and again, that's widened participation and brought in a whole variety of um, new people into the recording side of things. And um, we again link it into iRecord, and um, it was voted, I could say, without any arrogance, because it's not my design, I just um, do the verification behind the scenes, but for our technical people, fantastic accolade that um, BBC Wildlife magazine voted it one of the, the best um, citizen science apps. So we've had um, lots of publicity, we've had many inspiring recorders, lots of incredible records, including more than 50,000 Harlequin records that we've been able to receive and verify. And from that, we've been able to do what I think is some really fascinating science. And this is the part, again, which has been in collaboration with, with many different people. And I'm just going to go through quite rapidly some of the science stories um, that have come out so that I can finish and we can have some time um, for discussion if you'd like, or coffee if you'd like. But one of the first things that we did was using the data that we had, we were able to kind of imagine the country as lots of one kilometer squares where the experiments have been going on with arrival or not, or presence or not, of the Harlequin ladybird, or assumed not. And um, from this, we were able to look at eight native um, species of ladybird and their distribution trends over time. And just in sort of summary, seven out of eight of those species were showing um, significant correlations of decline with arrival of the Harlequin ladybird. And perhaps the most dramatic, well, the most dramatic was and is the Dahlia bipunctata, the two-spot ladybird, which showed about 44% decline in distribution, strongly correlated with the arrival of the Harlequin ladybird. So from this analysis, we went on to link with traits of the ladybirds, of life history traits, also to pull in climate data, and also using the land cover map data from the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology to look at habitats. And this was with my student, Richard Comont, who did some fantastic work over the course of his um, PhD. And really the take home message from that complex modeling was that Harmonia axvillis was is a major driver of change and influencing the distribution of these other ladybirds. Um, but of course, other factors are important as well. But Harmonia exodus was coming out as a very strong um, correlate. And then we worked um, with Rothamsted and um, particularly with um, a master student from Hull University, Dan Jeffries, um, using the um, vertical facing radar to look at um, the height at which ladybirds were flying and the speed at which they were flying. So some really fascinating um, work and, and quite eye-opening to think quite how high some of these ladybirds are getting and at the speeds at which they're going. Um, so mostly travelling at a mean speed of about 30 kilometres per hour, um, but some of them going um, some of them going faster and some of them going extremely high, perhaps showing huge potential for the dispersal um, and spread of these species. And then we've been able to just ask some quite interesting sort of academic questions from this data set. We have um, information on the colour pattern forms of the different ladybirds. Of, and of the harlequin ladybird, we have these melanic forms and also the non-melanic um, orange forms. And there was some work from Paul Brakefield, for instance, and others around thermal melanism and ladybirds. And I wondered whether 
the uh, melanic ones might have some advantage at the edge of the invasion range because in terms of spreading more rapidly because they might warm up more quickly and therefore um, move um, faster. So we had another master's student, Claire Kessel, working with us um, on this. We didn't find anything so exciting, but we were able to test out some really lovely models that had previously been used um, for looking at disease spread and show how useful they were um, in this context as well. And there was a tantalizing hint that there might be something going on because the succinia color form, the orange color form, was not doing so well in coniferous woodlands where temperatures were cooler. So maybe if we can get better resolution data and we can look at it again, maybe there are some patterns to tease out, but just at the moment um, we didn't show anything particular from these. Um, models. And then we've also, as I mentioned, been able to engage some people in recording natural enemies. And in some senses, I could say this was my greatest failure in citizen science, in that the BBC Breathing Places said, can we have a project that will be good for secondary school children? And I thought, well, what could be better than parasites? Surely they're going to love parasites, and we can talk about male killers and all kinds of things. And so we came up with this parasite project. And um, well, I like to think people did read the material, but I think we had about two people contributing across the country. So those two people are on the paper, and um, thankfully we were also doing some of the work ourselves. We did gather enough data, and we were looking at whether Harmonia axillaris had escaped from natural enemies or not, and indeed it strongly showed the case to be that Harmonia axillaris has a much lower parasitism rate than, for example, in this case, Coxella septum punctata, which can have up to 20% of its paras. Um, 20% pupil parasitism by the, um, follid, the forids phallocotophora. So there's a lot more work I think we can do on that. And indeed, I have another student, Katie Murray at Stirling University, who's working on a really intriguing little fungus, which is that yellow kind of little tiny fruiting bodies that occur on the ladybirds called Hesperomyces. And she's been doing some very detailed studies in terms of life history dynamics with this fungus. But she's also been calling out to the public to tell her about sightings of this fungus um, on Harmonia axillaris and other species. It's really poorly understood um, little fungus. And there's a lot that we can do to find out more. So I know that this conference has been themed around um, the, the Royal Ensoc journals. And it's been a really great um, pleasure to be able to contribute to those journals with various aspects of our research and we produced a review I did with Mike Majurus in 2006 um, for ecological entomology and we decided that it would be really nice 10 years on to take a look at some of the predictions that we made and whether or not um, we had some evidence to support them. So we just published this paper on 10 years of invasion and quite a few of our hypotheses were supported, quite a few we need to do a lot more work and some of them we were a little bit out but that's the way it should be, that's what makes it exciting. But I've also been able to make global collaborations. Harmonia axillaris is now a global invader. It's now been found also um, in New Zealand very recently, so it's occurring pretty much everywhere. And I had this great opportunity to bring together experts from around the world to look at global perspectives and to begin to build a traits database for Harmonia axillaris globally. And there are differences in the way it behaves in different parts of the world. I can tell you more about that some other time, perhaps. We've learned a lot of lessons about citizen science, and I've certainly learned a lot of lessons of what to do and what not to do in terms of getting people involved and what works and what doesn't work, and I still have a lot more to learn. But it's been great sharing ideas with other people around the world, such as um, through this paper with the equivalence of the UK Ladybird Survey from America, and looking at how valuable the data is in terms of addressing quite fundamental ecological questions, um, but how important it is to verify um, the, the records in order to get that high quality. So we've produced a variety of guides on the back of um, the, the um, studies that we have done, and we being, in this case, Michael Pocock, um, John Tweddle, and um, Lucy Robinson at the Natural History Museum, and um, working with the UK Environmental Observation Framework. Um, these are all free to, to download. So I am coming to an end, and I thought it would be appropriate to mention um, Mike Majurus, who was a fellow of the Society, and who sadly died in 2009, and um, an amazing and um, passionate communicator who taught me so much. I felt I had so much more to learn um, from him, and for sure I would have done. Um, but one of the things I have been able to learn from him um, since his untimely death, so he had produced a lot, his last manuscript 
and his wife got in contact with Cambridge University Press and asked was there something that could be done with this manuscript and so they asked myself and Peter Brown to edit it and to bring it up to date and it, it's been reviewed so that um, a number of people have also provided information to go into it and it will be out hopefully um, in October and it's just been an absolute delight to read um, his last work and it will be absolutely fantastic um, to see it in press. It's enormous, I'll say that, and um, I think it has something like 250 or more photos and illustrations. It was extremely time consuming going through all of those, but um, a great pleasure, and it's already getting very nice feedback. So just in the closing moments to think about um, future directions. I really want to scale up in terms of understanding the interactions with Harmonia Axiridis. I still think, despite all the work that we've done on it, I still do a lot of hand-waving around what kind of impacts is it really going to have? How is it going to influence aphid populations, for instance? Are there going to be any really big losers? Is there going to be an equilibrium that eventually is reached? We have so many questions that we want to be asking, and I think that taking a network perspective would be a really fantastic way to begin to embrace some of that complexity. And I really love it when I take my mind into ecological places where I no longer understand what's actually going on. And I think that's what we would do if we began to unravel this network. But we can begin to understand some bits and pieces of the jigsaw and um, pull it together. I do think we should celebrate parasites. I mean, who wouldn't love that lovely little grub crawling out of um, that ladybird? They're absolutely fantastic and inspiring, and I'm sure that people could get on board with recording them um, in the future. I would really like to continue with the global collaborations that I've um, been working with some amazing people around the world. And I'm off to Chile next year um, to work with some fantastic people there. And I've increasingly working with a group in the Czech Republic and also Slovakia and it's really exciting to have those collaborations so they're also ways in which I would be continuing um, with what I'm doing. So thank you very much, I've said far too much I'm sure but um, I can't help but indulge in the ladybirds and um, a particular thank you to all of the citizen scientists and volunteers who've contributed so much um, to the stories that I've told. Thank you. People won't begrudge five minutes or so to ask you questions of their coffee break, before their coffee break. So, hello, is waiting, ready? Somebody ask a question. Did parasitoids, parasitoids is 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 a synonym used by entomologists in this sort of a little less margin than parasites. Yes, sorry, I'm at the end. Parasitoids. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's just a yes. Yes. No. And it's a good suggestion. And it means human question all about quality control. Yes. Because we're trying to monitor an invasive fly in, in, in space. And, and we realize that there is a certain even growers who are who not always reliably recognize a, a fly as such in better known species. Yeah. I so quality control is a really important issue within citizen science. And I think that if you have known quality, then that can be really useful. So if you know the level of errors that are within your data that's coming in, you can kind of model that within your, um, when you're doing your analyses. Of course, the idea would be that you have very high quality data coming in in the first place. And we're really fortunate with the ladybirds that they are relatively easy to identify and I can definitely identify them from a photograph. So when we're doing our analysis, we're only using those records for which we've been able to identify them and verify them, or they come from a known recorder, so we know that they know what they're entering as well. But a couple of years ago, I ran a project um, called the Big Bumblebee Discovery, and we were using uh, um, color forms, color groups, um, for the identification of the bumblebees. And so I think you can break down the project into something a little bit simpler, depending on who your audience is, to um, still address some interesting questions. But what was actually really interesting about that project, the big bumblebee discovery, which we just published in PLOS One, was that even when we just had six color groups, the errors, when we looked at the photos 
it was really, really high. People weren't, um, we needed to do more training even around the colour group. So I think training is really important and making sure that people are well informed. And I think that you know, the, the idea that with something like citizen science, you can just post stuff up on a website and people are going to take it and run with it. That just isn't the case. You do have to invest an enormous amount of time in providing feedback and also in terms of providing training. And I knew that our Bumblebee data could have been better if we had, for example, held a webinar, if we had trained um, some school teachers in terms of, there were some amazing posters and beautiful resources um, produced for this project. Um, but I don't think people fully engaged with it. And so the error rate was really high. And then that meant that all we could do is look at abundance data rather than look at the diversity of um, using these different color groups. So I think it's a big issue. I think there are ways to get around it and you can be quite imaginative about those ways, but it does take investment of time and money, yeah. Right. Okay, thanks very much, Helen. Thank you.